Okay, uh, welcome to class tonight. Uh, we do have a couple of people on Zoom. So I'm probably gonna sit down most of the time just so that they can they can be feel more involved and see me. Um, and Allie, Allie and uh, Mackenzie, if you have questions, if you have stuff to add, uh, just get my attention or send a message or uh, whatever you wanna do. Like I just consider you guys uh, part, full participants of the class as much as you want, so. Uh, today, we will be covering the death penalty, but uh, Bree, uh, you wanted to talk about the midterm exams? Oh, I don't think I do. I just wondered if they were going through. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I did, I did get, uh, I did get everything graded and all the midterm grades uploaded. Um, I did get the distinct feeling that for a lot of people, uh, whether you just didn't have time, maybe you were uh, emotionally uh, and or physically exhausted or whatever, but I did get the distinct feeling that uh, not everybody, but that there were a substantial number of people that uh, didn't put in uh, uh, the kind of study that it requires to get a good grade. Also, um, hints for acing the uh, essay portions of the midterm. Uh, those are real specific things, and uh, many people ignored any of those things. And, you know, it just felt like more people were just adding in, uh, you know, big words, you know, to just make the paragraphs go longer. And I'm really looking for specific things uh, that show me that you practiced the essay that you prepared and, you know, that you can define key terms, that you can give examples. And uh, I just, lo I'm looking for something more substantial. So uh, a lot of times what happens is the multiple choice portion of the exam is tough for people. And what I really hope is that they put a lot of effort into the essay portion because um, if they do and they show that they have a working knowledge of the essays, then you know I will grade them very generously. And sometimes those two things even out uh, for the midterm and the final, but um, I don't know. Did anybody have any questions about the midterm? I don't feel terrible about where the class is at grade-wise. You might you might not like exactly where you're at, but this this class is designed that it's sort of loaded pretty heavy in the back half of the of the semester because. Coming up, we have four consecutive documentaries that we're gonna watch, uh, including tonight, we're gonna watch Inside Death Row. I will warn you that it's pretty intense just because it goes through the lives of four different individuals that are literally on death row. So um, th they're not gonna gross you out with like any anything, but it it's a moving, uh, it's a moving experience to see what their actual experience is like. So just be prepared that, you know, there's there's some things that tug on the heart in there a little bit. Yep. So will you be posting it somewhere on Canvas so that we can go back and watch it and kind of like Um I have it I have it in Google Drive. And so if you want to be able to refer back to it, sometimes they're on YouTube. I don't think this one is on YouTube. But I, you know, just shoot me an email uh, or during break, I, know, I could probably just add you to it if you wanted. So I'm happy to do that. It's, I mean, literally, it's just, you know, I right click and add your email address to it. So it's not hard to do. Uh, keep in mind that the that there is a response paper that is due uh, for each of the documentaries. It's five percent of your grade. So those four papers turn into 20%, which is two, obviously two full grade levels. So you're gonna to wanna to put some effort into it. It is, it is a 5% grade. Um, I wanna make sure when I grade these, um, I don't want you to think that just turning something in gets you an automatic A. I don't want you to think that very little effort um, 
I'll just give you a generous grade. I want to make sure that you actually put some thought, you use some critical thinking skills. I want to see that you've invested yourself in the response paper. That being said, it doesn't need to be eight pages long. You know, it is a 5% grade, but make it matter, make the most of it, and you'll get, you'll get an A if I can, you know, you'll get 100% if I can tell that you've actually done more than spent 10 minutes or less throwing together some words that you think will suffice. Um, if you turn something in, I'll give you a grade for sure. Uh, but I just want to make sure that you understand that I'm not a slave driver in this class, but I do actually expect that people take serious the assignment. And I know how it is. I've been a student before. Sometimes it, you get you get behind, you procrastinate, things don't get done. If that happens, don't be surprised if you don't get the grade that you want. Um, so I would encourage you to just pay, if you pay attention, if you take notes, most of you won't need to go back and watch it to get a very good grade, even 100%. You won't need to watch it multiple times. You know, just pay attention to what we watch tonight. Take notes. I, don't, I actually, I've never prepared for one of these, so I don't really know exactly how you do it. I just know that if you pay attention and absorb it and take good notes, you should be fine. What do you do next class? Yes. Yeah, it's it needs to be turned in before six o'clock next Monday. And I, yeah, I think there's a, you upload it. You upload it to uh, turn it in or something like that. So. Has it been how long? There's, there's no uh, specific length on it. And it's literally just five questions. I want you to put intentional thought into answering those questions so that I know that this is a priority for you, okay? So, well, the next four weeks, we'll have a documentary each night. Each one of those four, you have to turn in a response paper to get your 5% grade. And that needs to be turned in, uploaded to Canvas before the next class period. Because once that class period time ends, then then I won't be accepting any late work. So make sure it gets in on time. And if you, you know, don't have Wi-Fi or something, make sure that you know you get it turned in so that you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Any other, these are good questions. Any other questions about the, the documentaries, about the midterm, anything like that? Okay, cool. I want to uh, give Braden a uh, class attendance credit here. All right, good to go. All right, um, well, today we are gonna cover uh, the death penalty. Sometimes it's called uh, capital punishment instead. Um, it, is, it is an important issue that we do face uh, incarceration. Um, a lot of things are wrapped up into that, but as you did studies or as you've gone through life, what are some of the ethical issues surrounding capital punishment and the death penalty? Sometimes they argue against it, like proven innocent. Okay. I don't say something about that. So many people were proven innocent afterwards. All right. Who can tell me how? What's the percentage of people that are on death row that 
are innocent at any given time. I was thinking something super small, like, is it five, 10%? Very good. Very good, Allie. It's 7% to 10% at any given time that are on death row are actually innocent. Um, how many people have great faith in government period to be efficient and good at what they do? How, how many people have a lot of confidence? You know, there's a lot of things that don't get done super well, right? Now, does that mean that we hate our governments? No, it just means that we realize that efficiency and uh, you know doing it well don't always go together in in government processes. And when it comes to the death penalty, that is in the hands of the government. And seven to ten percent of people that are on death row uh, are innocent at any given time. So Bree, that's a, that's a good one. That is one of the ethical issues surrounding it. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, nobody wants to see innocent people lose their lives. So, but we'll get into that a little more because some people might argue that's not enough of a deterrent that we don't have the death penalty. And some people might say that is enough alone that we shouldn't have the death penalty but you know you de depending on what ethical uh framework you uh you argue from you might say in spite of that in spite of that being a bad thing you know it's still uh the best the best choice is to have the death penalty even in spite of that but that is that isn't it is at least an ethical issue that we that we should address what else? A lot of people wait a long time before actually getting executed. Yep. Does anybody know what's the average length of stay on death penalty or for the death penalty? Anybody want to take a guess? 10 years. Allie, was that Allie? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh my gosh. Right. You're on a roll, Allie. Thank you. Yep. 10 years is the average length of stay. Now, uh, Charlie, why would you say that length of stay is an ethical issue? Because I understand that the execution process is expensive, but why put someone, why give them the sentence of death, then make them wait a decade before actually carrying it out? Okay. Like the anticipation death. of it. I don't know. Well, and you'll get to see. I mean, they have nothing better to do. And it's not like they're going to get out. Right. So why, why? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, if what they did is bad enough to put them on death row, why do they get, you know, to die so quickly? I mean, if they, you know, kill uh, or do mass murder or school shooting or they kill innocent children or they're molesters and they get to make their death anymore. Okay. Allie and Mackenzie, can, can you hear what Peyton was saying? Um, it was a little muffled, but if you could just repeat what she said. Okay. Nice. Sure, sure. Uh, Peyton, I'm going to try to summarize what you said, and if I don't get it right, you correct me. All right. Okay. Uh, but Peyton's, uh, Peyton pretty much, uh, what I heard her say summarized is that, uh, they did a crime, therefore they deserve to be punished. And so however long it, it takes is not is not a significant issue. Did I summarize that appropriately? Yeah. Okay, all right, she said I did. Um, Charlie, on the other hand, uh, I don't think you agree with her though, do you? No. Why would you disagree with what she said? Because it's just, there's no point 
in making someone wait for the for the day that they actually die. Like if you designate them to be put to death, then set a date for them to actually be put to death. Let them know the day they're gonna die. And don't let it be years away. It could be some months away, I guess, but don't let it take years. Because then they'll just sit comfortably in their cell. Okay. Did you all hear, Allie and Mackenzie, did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. I think going back to like the innocence thing, like sometimes it like new evidence takes like years down the road. So if they kill somebody like right off the bat, then like three years later, new evidence comes up and they were actually innocent, then they really did that. Say that again. Like, like they have new evidence that the person was innocent, but they killed them right away. And like they want to have a chance to be. Like, I don't know what I'm trying to no, say. No, I, I do. Uh, Bree said that um, one advantage to the death sentence taking a, a, an average of 10 years is that if new evidence comes to light that would uh, let them be innocent, yeah. then uh, if, they, if, they had, if it's stretched out a longer time, then they have more time to be proven innocent, as opposed to like if they got a death sentence and they were put to death like a year or two in and and then all of a sudden after they died then they found new evidence that would exonerate them she said that that's that's one issue that that would be in the in the person's favor what's the average of cold cases in america cold, what's cold what do you mean by cold case cases that are unsolved and will remain unsolved until new evidence can be. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, okay. I, I do think that once you're, uh, once you're given a death sentence, I think even if you're actually innocent, I think it's very, very hard to get it overturned. I would nearly 185,000 cases of homicide and non bumping manslaughter went unsolved from 1980 to 2000. Yeah. Well, what are some other ethical issues that surround the death penalty? We've come up with some good ones. Innocence, length of time. What else? The divine command theory would be something that plays in the part between like killing wrong and killing. Well, um, I mean, divine command theory is tough uh, unless you can actually get a direct message from god which most of us have a hard time doing but and if you use the bible there is a lot of killing for for killing being one of the ten commandments of don't do it there's an awful lot of killing uh in the bible so um i find to be i find divine command theory i tend to shy away from it on specific things unless it's like about love and unity and uh some of the things that we know that we associate with god but in terms of death penalty because the bible is so it fluctuates so much on what it says and what it does and and stuff I, you know we've we as a people of faith have had a difficult time reconciling this God that loves unconditionally, according to the Jewish and Christian Bible, with the fact that sometimes it's not very practical to not kill. You know, sometimes, sometimes we're put in situations where the the crime we feel like deserves some type of punishment, or that we have a justification that this would be an exception where killing would be okay. And so we just it's just difficult to, to nail that down to divine command theory. Uh, but I do think that you could make, you know, most, most of the times 
I think you could use natural law theory because what would be a tenet of natural law theory? It would be that what, 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 what is one thing that from natural law theory that just by the fact that we're human that we should all have? Life, right? So, you know, you could make an argument that uh, Bree, would you in, would you would you would you be comfortable with this ethical issue that you raised, which I think is a valid one, that we could call the sanctity of life? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if especially. Especially if someone believes in the sanctity of life, that it begins either at conception or shortly thereafter, uh, you would think in terms of people that want, that support that sanctity of life argument, it could easily be uh, transferred to the argument about the death penalty. So... So you could argue from a natural law theory that as humans, we are, uh, we deserve life and that shouldn't be taken away. That could be one. Um, I mean, could you argue that um, once like you, I guess, uh, don't really, or once you like, you give up your natural rights as soon as you violate another person? Sure. I mean, that's like an outdated, I guess, mindset that I but like, uh, I mean, but like, maybe. I mean, like, I for an eye, but I mean, uh, I guess, could you argue that violating others in natural relationships is their own right? Yeah, and oh, what ethical framework would that fit perfectly in? Social contract theory? Yeah. Is that what you're going to say, Alan? Mm -mm. What were you going to say? I think that the death row. In some type of way, these values of human life and human beings. You kind of say that again. The value, the values like human life and human beings. And my reasoning is that if you kill someone for them being like murderers, for example, you become complicit with that by doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's agreed on by the masses. That's the only difference. I just don't think any everyone like I don't think anybody deserves to die. I get really back and forth on it because, like, looking at it, I can be like, I get that, but I also like put myself in a position like, if somebody's on death row because they like murdered a little kid, I put myself like, if that was my little kid that somebody murdered, yeah. I'd probably lose my shit. Like, I want them to die. Like, I go back and forth on it. Like, sure. I agree, but like, I feel like if you haven't killed, like, I feel like that's an easy way out. That was them. Living like, I would rather have them do that. Than yeah. So what? That is true. But you, but, but you're. What about people who don't like? What about people who don't care what they did? Because there's some real messed up people that yeah. could just walk into a building and shoot you and not like give a damn about their life. So well, that raises another argument. It's just, this is just so broad. That, that raises <laughs> the argument of the mental state of the person of the ending. Now, now what Alan said, uh, just to summarize that, was that uh, that every that life is the one thing that shouldn't be taken away, is what you believe. Well, I just believe that, for example, like like a conviction for a rapist is not them to be raped back. Does that make sense? Right. A conviction for a rapist should they shouldn't be raped back. Like the the punishment should be different because if we do the evil things that it's they different. did, then we are complicit yeah, in the what thing. they do. So you're essentially devaluating human life and what human life stands for and dignity because you're doing the same thing. By, by, yeah, that if we do those same awful things to them, then we are not showing hu human dignity, and that and that brings us down to where they were. Yeah, like just because they did something bad doesn't mean that we 
are required to be like they were, is what you're saying, right? Now, th that's a good point. And what ethical framework? There's a perfect ethical framework uh, that you could use uh, to make that argument. Do you know what it is? Um. I have to go back to Primo. <laughs> what, what what ethical framework would say that human dignity and respect is one of the highest priorities that we that we would have? Natural rights. Natural rights, sort of like you know, um, the problem with natural rights is, is that's actually those are laws and principles set forth by a ruling society, and in the United States. Uh, you know, one of the ruling societies, part of, some of them allow the death penalty. So, justice not justice is fairness, but um, what ethical framework could Alan use to make his argument that uh, human dignity and respect is the highest priority and that it would be it would not be moral to do to killers and rapists what they did because it would it, we would we would be infringing on human dignity and respect and that's that's never okay anybody want to guess no Man, what's that Braden? categorical imperative now why why would that fit so well Braden? yeah it, number one it's universal yeah if it's wrong to murder it's always wrong to murder right and part of the categorical imperative is designed to and reinforce human dignity and life. And you're not supposed to use people as a means to an end. And if, if you're going to kill someone in order to make a safer society, whatever argument you wanna make, I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. just making one argument, then you'd be using that person as a means to an end, right? To make a safer society by getting rid of them. And, each in ind each individual in categorical imperative is an end in and of themselves. So they should be treated with respect, even if they didn't. Now, I think, I can't remember if this is the one where uh, uh, Immanuel Kant breaks his categorical imperative. There's one, that, there's, there's a couple that he breaks his own categorical imperative. So when we go through, um, will remember, but I think, I think this might be one of them. Um, but let's go back to the one that you brought up uh, was, was uh, social contract theory. Um, that would be the one, social contract theory is the one that oftentimes is used to argue for the morality of the death penalty. Because in social contract theory, it states, once you're born, you have these rights, correct? And part of these rights are that you get to live and you have uh, individual liberties and freedoms and you can breathe and you have clean air and all these things are protected by society. But how can you, uh, how can you mess that up? That's right. Yeah, you have to give up some liberties to get that protection, right? So one of the liberties that you give up is, is that, well, you can't go around killing people, right? Because if you do, that means you broke the social contract and therefore society's protection of you is wiped away and you don't have that protection anymore. So what someone with social contract theory would say is that, yes, uh, it might be bad to kill people, but it's morally acceptable in this case because you broke the social contract theory. You weren't supposed to kill anybody. You did, therefore you will be put to death. That's one argument. Does that make sense? 
All right, what are some what are some other ethical issues surrounding death penalty? One of the big issues is when people plead insanity. And the only reason why I say that is because so this probably could come to me is because my aunt and uncle were murdered um two years it would be two years ago on March 17th. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um and the trial has I mean been postponed because of like COVID, but all the evidence has points to this one guy, they have enough evidence and DNA to prove that it was him, but he was trying to plead insanity because that's legitimately his last report. And I feel like that's totally unfair to try to do something yet like that drastic just to get out of something that he totally deserves. Whether it's life in prison or the death penalty, I really wouldn't care what happened to him, but you know, I just think that it's a bit ridiculous and far fetched. So, so you had two family members that were killed a few years ago, and the killer, everybody knows, did it. He's pleading insanity, and you see that as a problem that you don't want people that are guilty to get off for insanity plea, at least in this case. Yeah, because I feel like some people just use, well, not like some people do have like, sanity issues sometimes but then other times like I feel like they try to use that because they know like their plea deal or anything will get lessened and that isn't fair I think they really need to investigate and make sure they really do have issues because otherwise that's not fair that's just lying thank you Mackenzie I agree with her Peyton agrees there are, there are a lot of people that do I mean, they can go to pretty drastic measures to come off quite crazy. I mean, it's pretty easy for them to say, oh, the voice has told me to do so. And you wouldn't know because you're not in my head. But, you know, I mean, I'm sure people would have to go a lot further than that. But I'm just saying, like, it should definitely be investigated. They should have to run lots of tests, lots of background history, so on and so forth. But being sent to a psych ward, I mean, it's not like it used to be way back when and you know i just feel like i really deserve it like he just he killed two innocent people and it wasn't a gunshot it was a crime of passion because he stabbed him to death that is considered a crime of passion because he it was it was intimate it was an intimate killing. so you know, why should he just sit in a jail cell, get three meals a day, be able to go outside and interact with other people, play board games, watch TV? He, he literally gets to do everything else he gets to do except he gets to. I mean, yeah, but he doesn't have he doesn't have his freedom. But he still gets three meals a day. He still gets to go outside. He gets sunlight. He gets to interact with people in the prison. He just doesn't get to you know go outside the fence. But it's kind of that, a big deal. He gets to do everything else he could do. Breathe, breathe. So you're saying you put him to death quickly? I'm just saying that. Jalen has yeah. been patient. Let's mm -hmm. let's hear from Jalen. So and normally in those cases when they do plead insanity, there are tests and they do have doctors checking to see if they actually are. And if they are proven insanity, they can in public their attorneys that as well. So if he's trying to insanity and he knows that he's not and he has never seen any type of medical attention for his mental issues, there's no proof or records of anything like that, they're most likely not going to drink. Jalen said that uh, if there, there are a lot of uh, steps to prove insanity and that uh, people can be in trouble if they are, if they're not being honest about that and um so thank you Jalen. i like your mask by the way i know another issue like when i was reading it i tried to like put back through and find it but i couldn't but i know something they talked about was like minors 
Oh yeah. 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 I just meant like it was in a kind of the same paragraph of like um would it would it ever be okay to would would the death penalty uh for minors ever be acceptable i mean if the crime fits yeah yeah i feel like it depends on the severity of the crime that they did i think how old too like if they're like 17 they're almost not so if the, the closer they are to 18, the more culpability you think yeah. that they would have. Okay. No mercy for anyone of any age. No mercy of, for anyone. Of, what if they're 10? If they're old enough to kill someone, then they're old enough to die for their crime. That's how I feel about it. Okay. What if it was your boy and he was 10 years old and he killed somebody? Send him away. I'm not next. Depends on if it would be the concept of murder or murder. Okay, so to, for you, it would matter the type of murder. It's and... like an axe, like say he's, you know, playing and he splits that so like if another kid, kid hits his head and his eyes, that's not intentional, not kind of passion, it's an axe. Right. But it is premeditated. It's, it's premeditated or he... So, and the fighting a kid and kills him. Take him away. But there is a specific age where kids learn. I mean, can home. pick up right or wrong. I believe it's um. Just learn to just. It's like they're adolescents when they start to pick up from right to wrong, and they understand that hitting somebody is bad, and lots of other stuff is bad, and they know that you know they can. Pretty much differentiate that right from wrong, okay. and it's not preschool, but it's probably I feel like early grade. Yeah, early grade school. What what other ethical issues come up when you think about the death penalty? Has anyone said anything about cost? Nope, nobody said a word. Okay, well, it's not really like like a big ethical thing, but there's like issues depending on the cost of the death penalty. Talk to us a little more about that, Mackenzie. Um, well, on the research I did for my first essay, it said that the cost for the death penalty, like going through with it is more expensive than them like living there, like at the prison and providing care for them. But I don't know. That's just what I. That is what the boss book said, isn't it? That yeah. um, when I before I researched this, I would have made the assumption that it was actually cheaper to uh, to provide the death penalty as a consequence of bad behavior than life in prison, but the boss book said repeatedly that it does not, it's not that way, that the average cost for the death penalty, it's really expensive and that it's actually cheaper to offer life in prison. Yeah, because I always thought that the death penalty would be cheaper, but when I read that in the book, it kind of surprised me. Yeah. Yep. Um, hold on. Let me. And I'm trying to find it. I just saw it. Have we also talked about method of death? Have we brought that up? I want you to hold that thought, Allie. Okay. I'm good. Uh, so don't forget it. We're going to come back to it. So, Braden, what did you say? $138 million in 2008. Was that in California alone? Okay. And how many deaths did they uh, occurred in California in 2008 for $138 million? Yeah. Okay. In 2008, there were uh, state of California spent $138 million. This was one state. Last I knew we had more than one state 
in America, right? For $138 million, I want you to take a guess at how many deaths happened uh, for, with the death penalty in the state of California in that, that year for 138 million, how many deaths took place under the death penalty? Charlie says four. You said five or six by Bree. Anybody else? Zero. Zero. Can any of you students think of anything that the state of California could have done with $138 million to make life better for their any 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 how how many how many uh college careers could have been launched or made better with 138 million dollars? A whole lot. Yeah. Instead, what we got just in one state was $138 million of nothing. You know, no deaths because the reason that the death penalty oftentimes takes 10 years is that the, I don't know if you've ever been part of a legal process. I mean, I just had issues like with my, uh, the mother of my children with uh, child support and custody. And it wasn't even like a brute, it wasn't like we were like hateful or anything like that. It's just, we did go to court and it took like two and a half years. I think it took my dad like three, almost three years to get him. Yeah. My mom, like literally gave me to my dad and it still took like three years. Yeah. So I'm just saying that it takes forever, you know, because a lot of times what would happen, we'd have a court date and then the judge had to go on vacation or we'd go on, we'd get a court date. And then like two weeks before one of the other, the other lawyer has a conflict. And so they have to reschedule. I mean, it's just, I mean, we got kicked down the, we got, they kicked the can down the road so many times. I can't imagine. I, I totally can see how it would take 10 years with appeals and, and court dates for the death penalty when it's obviously much more important you know, there's much more at stake than custody or uh, or child support or anything like that. So I can see how it would take 10 years. Yeah, Jalen. Yeah. I'm not sure what they call it out here. So your your family has Jalen has experienced uh how long and drawn out even simple court dates can can be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the cost is is something, and uh, is is it an ethical issue that we spend so much on the death penalty? Um, the other question I would have is, is it an ethical issue that uh, killing someone for killing is not our only option? That when life in prison is an option, is that a more desirable option? Um, I'll answer the first question. I think that money, unless it is a super serious crime that really needs to like, be done with a death penalty, can go towards other things like education, um, uh, just other things that really need help in America. Because I don't know what goes on around the world, but in America, we really need to better our money, in my opinion. But if it really needs to happen, if someone needs to go through the death penalty, then I guess that's fine. But I would say put the money elsewhere because we really need money elsewhere. Okay. Did you all hear what she said? Okay. Thank you, Allie. Like going on to the second part of it, I don't remember where it said it. I know I read it in here, I read my paper. It said something about like instead of the death penalty, like 
the special like isolation or whatever confinement where like they don't have to go outside or like the things that you was talking about. Right. Like it's a little more serious than just like normal so you're saying it is at least a valid argument that one could make that offering someone the death penalty is maybe a little too extreme if life in prison and there, there's appropriate punishment without the death penalty. Besides the death penalty being stuck in solitary confinement is the worst thing you ever had. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Solitary confinement. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Is there a human issue? Like, just because someone, I mean, I don't think anybody's gonna make any excuses for someone that was murderous, uh, but does society have to treat, you know, going back to what Alan said, is do, are we obligated to treat someone inhumanely uh, because they treated someone inhumanely or are we a better, are we a better uh, society if we treat all people with a, at least a base level of respect and dignity? What do you think? I don't know if we're necessarily like obligated to treat them the way it's like if they killed somebody to like think about them, but I think it's kind of like, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like just how like we judge somebody when they do something wrong. I think it kind of depends on the situation. It depends on the situation. If somebody goes into a school and shoots it up, like, I will never look at that person. I have lost all respect for that person. So if they went to a school and shot it up, you'd lose all respect. Does that mean that they should be, if they're not going to be put to death, does that mean that they should live a life of inhumane treatment the rest of their days? Yeah. Well, not only killing them, I, I would I would argue that taking away basic, you know, putting someone in solitary confinement for like the last 30 years of their life, I think that's inhumane too, I would say. Braden says if they weren't crazy before, they'll be crazy after that. I feel like they're like, I don't like. Death is too easy of a way out for them. Yeah. Jalen like, says death is too easy, easy of a way out. out yes, I feel like Jalen is a pretty easy way out. Would you and I explained before you? because it, you know you get three meals a day, you still get to go outside, you still get to interact with other people, but it's still like I, still have other privileges, but you know, you just can't go into the outside world, you can't go beyond the tent. But you yeah. still the you argument I would strongly disagree with. The argument is, are we going to stoop to their level? Are we going to do to yeah. them as they did to others? Right. So, so do you feel like they should be out in the open free to do whatever they please? I, I would like to hear from Alon because this is a this is the one where there's a fence and every class, some people are on one side and some people are on the other. And I, I just want to make sure that we get both voices out here. So Alon, uh, talk to us about what you're thinking about that. Um, I just want to address, I respect what you're saying, but I, I don't think that jail is an easy way out. And you, well, like, for that reflected something personal, so I can tell you the same thing. My dad was in prison for a long time. And when I saw, when I saw him for the first time outside of prison, I couldn't even, like, recognize him. Because he was, like, so different. Like, he was so, like, malnourished and, like, so skinny, like, to the bone, literally. I couldn't recognize him and he like he didn't really want to talk about it but like i know that he suffered plenty in there like plenty and his crime wasn't even like like a bad 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 crime you know like the ones we're talking about so i don't think that jail is an easy way out like i really really don't just based on my experience with my father i i do i do think that most people that have lived a decent life, like a middle-class-ish life, and that haven't been in jail, oftentimes look at jail as it not being too bad. But I have a feeling that it's more like what Alan said, where people really do, it's not, it's not a joyful, uh, easy experience in there, and that it's much worse than people think. 
Uh, I'll get to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna go over here. Right. What, what you described there, Shelby, about people that are in isolation, they get to come out for one hour a day. That's what uh, that's what it's like for every one of the four guys that are in our documentary video. And keep in mind that they've been in there a long time. And you imagine, I'm, I'm single. I've been single off and on most of my life. And uh, it's, it's difficult if you go through long stretches, like if I'm not dating or something and there's no physical touch, but even that I have children. So I, I get physical touch and, you know, when there's not a pandemic, I have friends and, you know, we'll touch, but these guys that are in the documentary, literally they never, I mean, they're not around other people. They get one hour of isolation a day you know, it doesn't sound like a great thing to me is what I'm saying. It sounds like if you're not crazy when you go in, you're going to be crazy when you go out. So, uh, hold on, Bree. Um, Jalen? I remember him vaguely. A little bit more like heavy built. And he recently just got out in Mexico. And he was... Your cousin went into prison heavy, heavy, and yeah. years later when he got out, he was like skinny, skinny. Yeah. Okay. Guys didn't even realize. Yeah. Three. Kind of like being in isolation, but like just a really relevant like reference. Like everyone went crazy when we had to be in quarantine, and like whatever. And it's not even like it'd be that, but like a hundred times worse. So like, we still got sunshine. We still have to play on our phones. Like there's still. No, but I mean, it drove people nuts, like not being able to leave the house. But it would be so yeah, much worse to be in and solitary. To not, like, yeah, just just being be in so much worse. quarantine. We, we yeah, it, just to like kind of put it into perspective. Yeah, prison like, would be like quarantine on steroids, right? Yeah. All right, Alon. Um, just to add, like, just like I know that, like, my dad's mental health horrible. I can't imagine a person being in prison for a longer, longer time. I know his mental health was very, very good. And it, that was only years. three years. Yes. So that's yeah. why in my head, I'm like, there is no way that jail is an easy way. Well, and I, I just don't think that in jail, there's a lot of, you know, to some degree, we can, we treat uh, people in prison as second class citizens. They, they kind of literally are, which means that sometimes their protection is also not necessarily a priority, right? So being in prison, it could be a very dangerous thing. I, I wouldn't want to be there. I talk to them often, like, we hear a lot about, like, prisons hurting other, and, like, especially if it's for, like, if you kill a little kid or rape a little kid, like, you're going to get killed in prison, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hold on a second, okay. Laney? Um, my mom was in, uh, was in the in for a really long time, and, like, yeah, they do get fed, like, two meals a day, they just have, like, activities outside, but, like, other than that, they're stuck in their cell, and like their meals aren't like what we like. Even the food cold is bad. Like, <laughs> the food in the prison is ten times worse. So like, they have three meals, but there's like no nourishment, and like you don't really have friends in here either. Like, I don't know. It just I think that going to prison would not be considered an easy way out. So your mom worked at the Bowling Green prison. Yep. And she saw firsthand that uh, the food there was was not particularly good. And uh, if you get a hankering for uh, Taco Bell cheese fries, what are you gonna do? You're not getting any, right? Yeah, that's true. And not all the guards like since then, they either. Yeah. Yep. 
no, not even the, you know, the guards don't necessarily treat everybody well. Uh, Braden, we'll get to you. Jalen? I just wanted to comment. Um, we can have the friends here between jail and prison. Jail and prison, oh, there's yeah, a difference. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Allie or Mackenzie, did you did you all have anything to add? I just think, how about we not break the law? <laughs> that, that'd make life a lot easier. I mean, I know that's a, that's a hefty ask, but yeah, just don't break the law. That'd be that'd be great. Are are there ever any instances where people don't actually break the law? or they maybe break a small law, but uh, it gets blown out of proportion. Are there any yeah. examples of that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, um, my, my son, my son was dating a guy that's uh, Spanish, or he's, he's Mexican. And every time he would drive, from Macomb to Keokuk, uh, five times he got pulled over in Carthage as he, as he drove through, five times. I've driven through Carthage hundreds of times. I've never been pulled over, yet Ignatius, he got pulled over five straight times when he drove through. So I don't think that not breaking not breaking the law is a good start, but we also have to do better at protecting people, you know. And I'm I am not bringing that up to denigrate cops. I'm just saying the system isn't always fair to everyone, even if you're not breaking the law. And he didn't he wasn't breaking the law at, at any. They never arrested him or anything because he didn't break. He wasn't breaking the law. That kind of brings me to something else that I have in here, and it says, I get kind of like the race thing. It says that blacks are six times more likely to than whites to end up on death row. Yeah. 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 To me, this is a big one. Here, there's a couple of things that, for me, if we're going to deal with the issue of the death penalty, um, and I personally believe you can make a valid argument for the death penalty. I also think that you can make a very valid argument not having the death penalty. So I do have my personal opinion, but I do believe that either way, you can make valid arguments. I lean one particular way, but um, with, with racism, um, I'm going to give you some statistics that are in the book. And this goes back to what was just said, that a black male in the United States has a one in three chance of being in prison at some time in his life. One in three chance of being in prison, as opposed to if you're Hispanic, one in six. And if you're a white male, it's one in 17. So one in three, one in six, one in 17. So um, I think it's naive to think that that people in those demographics just simply break the law a lot more. I think it's more likely uh, that people are, that our system is, is one that like is racist. That, and, you know, if you, have you ever watched like, have you ever watched old, old TV shows where they're like, oh, we got to find out who, we got to find out who did this terrible thing. And so what do they do? You know, they go, they go pick up some people that they think nobody will care about, you know, maybe people of color or something like that. And they'll just pick them up and they'll beat the crap out of them until they, you know, confess or whatever. And uh, I just, I think stuff like that's happened in our country for years. And I am not saying that it always happens now, but I'm saying that I'm uncomfortable personally with the death penalty because I don't trust I don't trust our system uh, to do that. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that seven to 10% of people that are in 
prison on the death row are innocent. And for me personally, that really does disturb me. But you will need to know those figures uh, for the final exam. I'm certain they will are on the uh, multiple choice portion of the quiz or of the test. Well, actually, there is only multiple choice on the. There is no essay on the final exam. So, uh, the other thing, uh, let's see, where was this? Oh, all right. Another thing on the racist part of the system is that blacks make up 12% of the United States population, but 40% of death row inmates. I think that's substantial. Blacks make up 12% of US population, but 40% of death row inmates. Uh, those really concern me. Those really, really do concern me. Um, You know, we did bring up the issue of sanity. I also, I, I do think that the issue of sanity is an important one for us to talk about. How many people think that we do an adequate job of providing mental health care for people in the United States? Does anyone think that the need for mental health care and what we offer as a society is adequate? Does anybody think it's good? No. Rather than other stuff like that. I don't think it's good. Allie says no. Charlie, say that again. It's better for some rather than others because depending on culture and gender and where you grew up, some things may happen and they'll just tell you to shrug it off or you got to be strong. Right. And Okay, three. Okay, kind of going off that and I know you say money, but that, that's kind of like what I was going to say. Like, there's just so much like wrong with like how people need mental health. So when people don't seek out mental like, help when they need it, because people tell like males more than females to just shrug it off or like it's not okay to get sick. Or like people that don't have income or like good insurance, they can't go get the help they need because they can't afford that medical bill. So like it's just a big mess. And so it's definitely not where it needs to be. So you're really. you're saying that as a society, the need for mental health care services and what we offer, there's a wide yeah. gap between what is needed and what we offer. Yeah. Okay. Jalen? Um, in some states, if you do seek medical help and you are on certain medications, you cannot own a gun. So in in like some places, you can't own a gun if if you it's have mental right. health issues. Okay. Very dangerous. Right. Yeah. Someone gets addicted First of like all, cocaine. First of all, why? Second of all, we go to the prison. To, to the crime. Right. Like, right. You know, you bring up a very good issue. Back in the 1970s, uh, the common perception from Americans was that uh, prison's primary duty was reform. But in the 80s, it, it switched to where uh, the purpose of prison was not to reform criminals, but uh, to punish them. And we've never really looked back from that. Great. I kind of go off what you were saying, like, if I'm just getting what you're saying, like, if we don't help people that get addicted to that right way, they just fall back on that. I can kind of pull that from personal experience. Um, my mom died of she overdosed when I was little. And um, I have this journal of hers that like I read once I got older to kind of help me try and like cope with why she did what she did. Um, and like she, my mom lost both her parents before she was four years old. So like my mom went through a lot, she was raised by her sister who didn't really give a shit about her. Um, and so my mom was addicted to drugs by the time she was 13. Um, and so like I, I agree, like they don't, there's not a good type of help to help people get out of that. And like my mom and I did go to rehab and 
went home in jail and all of that, that she just like, obviously she went back to it because she like, like I can pull up from personal experience. Like we don't, and like we just judge those people rather than try and help them. Like my aunt told me, um, it was actually a couple of weeks ago because a couple weeks ago was the anniversary of my mom's death and I was real upset. My aunt even told me like she wishes she wouldn't have been so frustrated and mad at my mom and tried to help her more than she did like just tell her to get her shit together. Like that was one of the last things my aunt said that my mom was making me to get your shit together. And so like I, so so what you're saying is is that you you have firsthand experience where someone has legitimate mental health issues and doesn't. jail doesn't go to help that they you know and then when they come back out they still have those mental health issues and they go back to drugs or they I go back to the things jail I mean my mom was already messed up obviously but like jail she wasn't even in for very long like it, it had got her because she um uh, like when she got back to addiction she got her to like beat the shit out of her and so she gave me to my dad my aunt went to my little sister and like she still got to see us every once in a while like when she went to jail like nobody let her see us they didn't let her call us like she had no connection to us right to her family and like that's off sure. Yeah. yeah once you have a record it's hard Jalen, hold that thought ali did you want to add anything to this because when we asked about the mental health issues you did say something i didn't know if you wanted to share anything all i was trying to say was that i think mental health needs to be like something we need to go deeper into because as our generation is growing, we are increasing our mental health issues. And I feel like it needs to be looked at both from the outside and inside perspective of jail. Because in jail, you never know what situation you're in, whether, you, excuse me, don't mind that, whether you're on death row, in solitary confinement, or just in general population or mass security, it's super important that mental health is always looked at because you never know what a person's going through. Thanks, Allie. Jalen? I can relate to you. Um, my mom passed when I was really little. Um, she was, I won't say by who, but she was kind of mentally abused by someone. She didn't know that she was on drugs. She was fat shamed by a lot of people. And our family was not very really Asian culture. And skinny is what is very popular if you're overweight and you're 20, you're just kind of like, you're put down by everybody. But it got to the point where she had committed suicide because of the drug. And I didn't really have it. I didn't know it was like her to be on these drugs. I didn't know it be there for a long time. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. It's very difficult. I'd like to touch on that for a little bit. Because, sure. like, like, addiction is, like, very doable. But to, to a certain degree, um, there are, like, certain individuals, what is not possible that we've seen. It kind of comes, I don't want to say it comes down to personal responsibility at the end of the day, but in certain cases, providing a like huge, like, blanket service to everyone just isn't, I don't want to say like possible. And it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be as like effective to see significant results. Does that make sense? Like, I do think health needs to be there for in cases of and stuff. Right. But doing like switching a like, System to focus on reform, like specifically, I don't think it's going to be because there is like somewhat of a system. Of, uh, but, uh, You're saying you don't think that I think is like needed sometimes, and it comes down to like uh, onto a certain right, yeah. That uh, so you're saying that you don't think it's reasonable that. Uh, that reform should be the, should be the goal yeah. of, of, of 
that's just my own eyes just because like sure. i don't know, like my dad struggled with like alcohol like as a kid growing up and like like beat that because nice. saw what like what he was doing to the family so, you know what i mean right so like he took it on to his own You're saying he took it. He took his own personal responsibility to overcome. Yeah. So, okay. okay. People don't want. It. Sure. No yeah. Some sometimes people just are not gonna want to change. Hold on, Bree. Okay. Alon. Yeah, sure. You sure? Yeah, she has. It. Okay. Go ahead. I think along some like the heat in my face. That comment. First of all, alcohol is a little different than like drugs or substances. Second of all, um. I, the first time, like, after my mom died, because she was suicidal over this, that was what killed my mom. Um, I blamed her for a long time. I was only nine years old, so, like, I hated my mom. I, like, despised the fact that she would have chose drugs over her kids. But when I got older and I got hold of that little journal, um, it, like, describes everything. And um, my mom started doing drugs when she was, like, 11 years old. She died when she was 29, and that was, like, what? Half her life, more than half her life. I don't know, I'm not good at math on top of my head, especially in a math. But um, that she was addicted to things and she did try to get help. She went to rehab. She was in and out of rehab. She was in and out of jail. Like she did try to get help. And then it's just like when it's, you get to that point that like you can't. But I also have a cousin who did drugs. I mean, she was in her like early 20s when she started it. And then she had her son and she did get sober. So I do think it's like, it's not just as easy as like if they want to get help, they'll get help. Like now that I'm older, I do understand. Like I don't think my mom would have been like, "Oh, let me do the rest and die and leave my nine-year-old to raise my three-year-old and like, wish him the best." Like yeah, and I'm not trying to like disrespect your experience. Yeah, this is really why. I don't know. I'll save it for our drug and alcohol. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to put it on like present aspect. I'm not trying to like just. Oh no, I know. I'm just saying like that's just saying like you want to get help. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. here's the other thing. I, I guess I would just add two things. Um, number one, once again, and most of these ethical issues bring this up. It's not dealt with in the book. It's nothing I've read about, but I like to bring it up that I believe that in every, most of these ethical issues, there's two sides of the coin and you need both sides. Number one is we need personal responsibility, right? Like where possible, we need to say, I make my own decisions and, and, uh, and I gotta own that, right? But on the other side, in America, we like to shove off any societal responsibility by saying, oh, that's on you. That's on the individual. Now, individual responsibility is always going to be important. I, I'm a blue collar guy. I think everybody ought to take personal responsibility and own up to whatever they've done, right? But on the other hand, I think that society does have a responsibility to set their citizens up to succeed. And if they know where uh, people are going to struggle, if they know that young mothers are going to struggle with supporting people and getting educations, uh, and health insurance and things like that. Society has a responsibility to set us up to succeed. That means that we have the tools that we need to succeed as opposed to just, you know, the, I think you brought it up before, one of you two brought it up before that we like to blame people. Like um, if they struggle, like we put, they throw them in jail and then we just want to treat them like shit. like shit, right. And and I'm just saying that I think that there, you know, I would like to live in a world where there's a better balance of that, where we do hold people, if, if we did a better job of setting people up to succeed and do well, I would feel, I would feel more comfortable with impressing the personal responsibility on people because otherwise I feel like we're not doing our part as well. And when it comes to the sanity part, um, I'm just going to tell you what I've seen. I'm, I'm only, you know, only 50. You know, I'm like, damn, you're 50, you know? So, but, you know, compared to my parents, I'm a young man. So, um, but when I was growing up and I was born in 1970. So like I saw a lot of stuff growing up that isn't around anymore. One of those things 
are mental health institutions. You would be floored at how many mental health institutions there were all over the United States. I lived in Burlington, Iowa. That's where I grew up. We lived in a little town of, of West Burlington that was, that was right next to it. And right on the edge of town, there was a mental health institution. That's what it was. There was one in West Burlington. There was one in Burlington. Every little town you went through that was of any size at all, there were mental health institutions all over the country. Funding got folded. And what happened to those mental health institutions? They shut them down. Does that mean that we don't have mental health problems, that we don't have people with mental health problems anymore? No. What happened to those people with mental health issues? What, what happened to them? They had kids. They got kicked out and they got put on the street. What happens when you have mental health issues and you get thrown out on the street? A lot of times, a lot of times you break the law, right? So then what happens? Then you get put in jail. You think mental health people are doing any better in jail? No, they're not. All right, Shelby. Seems like they more so treatment for things like they should be. It leads more into them becoming like crazy and killing someone. It just like goes on and it's like, like it's not really like it. When I watch like Netflix shows and I see like psychiatric hospitals, it looks like they're treating them like so bad, which makes them be cool, become like, more rude. Yeah, if you want to see one that will put chills on your spine, watch American Horror Story. They have they have a psych ward in there that makes me scared just thinking about it. Yeah, I know those. That's that's not it's not really relevant, but yeah, I'm sure it did. But but that is a very good point, Shelby, because. Um, you know, we used to do a better job of taking care of our people, our folks that have mental health issues. When the funding got taken away, they got thrown on the street and a lot of them just ended up in jail as a result. And there were paying for psychotropic medicines and all kinds of stuff by, you know, taxpayers are, but they're not in a place that they're really getting the mental health care that they need and, and, and would benefit from. The other thing is, is, uh, what other group, what other demographic is there that suffers from a lot of mental illness? Does anybody, anybody know? The elderly. What's that? The elderly. Well, the elderly do, I'm sure they do, but I'm thinking of uh, veterans, people that have actually been in wars, you know, Vietnam veterans, you know, they're known for being, they're the highest, they're about the highest population of homeless people that you can possibly find. And those folks, you know, and back in, what was it, Nate, when did George Bush throw us into the war that has never had an ending, like in the mid 90s, right? 97, 98, something like that. So we've been sending people into guerrilla warfare and, and such for how many years now? 20, 20 some years. They're coming back with, they're all shot up. They've had to kill people. They've seen people killed. They've seen atrocities and they come back and you know there's not a lot there for them. Now, does that mean that they can't get help? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we have not that by getting rid of our mental health facilities, and especially if you're a kid, it's incredibly hard to find a mental health facility for a child. You might have to, you might have to send your kid four, five, six, seven hours away to be able to find a facility that will have room for them or a bed or something. But I'm just bringing this up. I'm not trying to tell you how to think about this issue. I'm just raising it that I do think that mental health is a valid concern 
And it makes me really uncomfortable personally that we put people to death, even if they really, really deserve it. I feel like life in prison is a better choice because I don't think that societal responsibility is up to snuff and that there's a lot of people that are getting the shaft on this. I was just going to touch on what you said about like women and stuff. Like, that's how like really bad PTSD. So, like, you have to take that medicine too. Like, yeah, PTSD uh, is terrible. It's just awful. Like, I, my dad was funny. And so, like, he, his anger and like violence can be really bad. And like, it relates back to his PTSD, I think. And like, people I'm sure that have it way worse than my dad. My dad was not in the all units, they did wars. Like, yeah. But when you have to take that into consideration, like, that could be, like, can be completely violent when they get home. Yeah, they can be very violent. How many people have actually worked with folks with mental health? Is it easy? No. No. I, I have family, I mean, close family, that has mental health issues. I have church members with family that have mental health issues. Telling someone to go get help, to take personal responsibility, it doesn't compute, okay? You know, a lot of times, you know, I, I, had, I had church members that were bipolar, and when they're on their medicine, they're doing great. So guess what they stopped doing? Yeah, because they feel great. They don't need their medicine anymore, right? So, I mean, like, when, you're men when you have mental illness, getting help is really tough. Just this weekend... One of my church members uh, has a 50-year-old daughter that is a drug addict. And it doesn't matter what if it's alcohol or pills. I mean, she just, she needs, she needs something. Like, it doesn't matter what the drug is as long as it's something. And she actually likes Adderall quite a bit. And if one's good, you know, bunches more, a handful is better, right? So this weekend, you know, my church member was, was losing her cool because, you know, she was so upset because her daughter had spent 48 hours of literally seeing snakes and spiders everywhere around her house. And she could not be, con she couldn't be told that they didn't actually exist. She just thought, well, people are trying to protect her they're trying to make it seem safer, you know, all, I mean, and she's, you know, she's been dealing with these mental health issues for years and years and years. She won't go get help. She won't go get help, but she's not, uh, she's not suicidal, at least not yet. So, I mean, dealing with people with mental health is tough. And even asking people to take personal responsibility with mental health issues, depending on what those mental health issues are, I mean, it's kind of a challenging thing to do. Like they probably can't, in many cases, they really can. So does that mean there is no personal responsibility? I don't think that's probably accurate, but for some people, if if their brain isn't working right, you know, or, or what do we do with, do you know how many people, uh, you know, we did talk about the elder, do you know how many elderly people live in independent living apartments that aren't really independent living? You know, they're just one step away from the nursing home, right? So they're there at the independent living, but they have dementia. It might only be, it's every day, but it might only be for part of the day, right? Well, you know, uh, I have a friend and she works at one of those and Eddie went out. Eddie's only like 67 years old, but he went out to, um, he went out to uh, Subway and he walked up behind one of the workers, kissed her on the back of the neck and said, you have a nice baby making body. He doesn't even know what he did, you know, because he suffers from, he probably doesn't even remember it, you know, and it's just good that he has a friend that he hangs out with a lot that can remind him, don't go to Subway anymore because they're gonna kick you out because he can't even remember that he got kicked out of Subway for being inappropriate and that's that's someone that lives at an independent living facility so i i i'm just concerned that you know we don't i just wonder if we do enough i haven't usually taken this much time to talk about this so i just want i just think it is important to at least bring it up 
that when we talk about the morality of the death penalty, I do think that it does it does make a difference. I think as a society, I'd like to see us personally, I'd like to see us do a better job of offering mental health services to people because I am seeing more and more young people, uh, middle-aged people and elderly, people of all ages really just struggling with it. Even even tonight, I mean, I had I had some people that missed class because they weren't, they were feeling the stress of life to the point that they're like, you know, at, at brink's end, you know? And so, Charlie? Um, you mentioned society a lot, but with the death penalty, I think society varies considering that the death penalty is based on what state you're in and it's that not is federal. true. That is true. And it's, and pr isn't it all just um, Southern states that were on the other side of the Mason Dixon line? Yes. I think so. Yes. Um, all right. Let me, let me go over a couple of things that are in the boss book. For one thing, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world with one of every 133 people in this country in prison. That's the highest by, that's five times higher than any other uh, country. You said one out of what? 133 people, one out of every 133 people in this country are in prison. That's five times more than any other industrialized nation. I'm embarrassed by that. Uh, the other thing that you need to know, and this will not be on the test, but you should know, is that private prisons are not good for people. Because if you, if the government's paying a third party to build a prison, what are they gonna want? They need people in those prisons, right? So if, if you're paying for, uh, you know, if you're having these people build prisons, they want laws that make sure that there's people in those prisons. And that's not good for the American people if you're there to serve a purpose of a contract. Galen? Equal it out. I don't. I don't. I don't think there is any equal in it out. I think they're all full, pretty much. Yeah. Hopefully, with the marijuana laws changing, I mean, so many people were in jail uh, and prison for marijuana use, which is ridiculous. But you know, it put lots of people in there. So I'm hopeful that'll start to go down. The other thing is, is I. I heard that uh, Biden did some things where private prisons were gonna be on the way out. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But from the early 2000s until now, or no, over a 10 year period, private prisons grew from six to like 506. Uh, it was literally private prisons were the fastest growing business in America during that time, which is insane that really, that's disturbing. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk, we talked about racism. We talked about sanity and mental health as issues. But I think that we also should uh, bring up the issue of, of poverty as well. Poverty, this is a big, this is a big deal if you ask me. Um, All right, of those on death row, and there, at any given time, there's usually about 3,000 people on death row, 99% um, are poor relying on public defenders. 99% are poor relying on public defenders. So if death row is full of 99% of the people on death row are poor, does that mean that only poor people break the law to the extent that they get the death penalty? No. They cannot afford a good lawyer. Right. You know, we saw, well, you didn't see it, 
but O.J. Simpson, he killed somebody. He did not get the death penalty, did he? Why? Because he has money, right, Jalen? At New Year's? O.J. Simpson? At Christmas? You sat next to O.J. Simpson? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the New England Patriots, Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick didn't even, not Bill Belichick, uh, the owner. I can't remember the Patriots owner's name. I can't remember his name. But, you know, he went to a massage parlor to, you know, have some fun. And they had him on video. And he got caught red-handed, but, you know, he's rich. It got dismissed, right? The videotape got thrown out. Why? Because he's rich. So do you think that the greatest indicator of if you get death row is, is it that you did the crime or that you're poor? Yeah. So is that fair? If only people that get the death penalty are po people in poverty, is that fair? I don't think it is. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna have a death penalty, I would say that you could argue from a justice's fairness situation that you need to apply that more fairly. And we don't. You know, if only poor people are getting it, that's shameful. It should be, it should be more evenly distributed. And justice's fairness is the perfect ethical framework to make that argument. All right. Uh, all right. Do you guys need a break? You need something to eat? I can't see your mouse. So give me a yes. Give me a no. You're okay. All right. If you need, um, I'll tell you what I need for some reason, my Thinking video isn't downloading to my computer from Google Drive. So I need five minutes to figure this out. So <laughs> go ahead and take a five minute break. How long is this video? It's 45 minutes. I'm just saying that drive can't handle at nine o'clock at night really sucks. It's nine o'clock. Well, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, I can just send you the video and you can watch it whenever you want. Thank you so much. I mean, does it, let me ask you this. I usually, I usually have us watch it in class because if you're like me, if I don't watch it in class, I'll get to it later and then I never do. Is it better to watch it in class or, or, or would, would you all prefer? Yes, you know what? Why don't to we watch, watch it, it in class the, or later? I feel we'll like I could. I just want to come to the discussion part at least. I, I mean, feel I, like I can watch it afterwards, take my notes, and really dig deep into it. But it's up to the class, not just me. Is that at our own range? I would rather you have it sent to. I think that'd be easier. Yeah. Do, do you, <laughs> Shelby? Do you have an opinion here? <laughs> Peyton. Uh, Allie and Mackenzie, uh, it looks like nobody wants to stay. I don't usually offer this option, but the fact that it's not downloading, it's super easy for me to share the file. And then you can play it from your laptop or your computer. Is Are that you okay? the file you already shared with me? Or yes. was that just, okay, I thought so. Mackenzie, I think I shared it with you too. Yes, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'll just watch it on my own time and take in-depth notes in depth notes so that way I can really get the assignment thought out and yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I will, I will share it before I leave here. I will just share that with you. Even if we watch it in conference, I'll go back. And rewatch it. My brain is at a conference. Okay. Uh, it will be on the exam. 
So I strongly encourage you to actually make time to watch it. And I would recommend that you do it soon. And remember that that response papers that response papers do before class next Monday. So yeah, the, the questions are on Canvas and you just need to download that, okay? So I guess we're done. I was gonna get it all set up, but I, I kept trying to download this file and it just kept saying it, it won't do it, so. Have a good one. Okay, all right, have a good one. I guess we're done, Allie and Mackenzie, and I guess you guys have everything. Yeah, yep. I think so. Okay, all right, well, thanks for being here tonight. Thank of course. You. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks.